All right, so we are going to do, uh, so we did integration by parts yesterday. Um, basically, we're gonna spend the rest of this week going through a, a few different sections from chapter seven. Uh, basically it's a chapter is entirely devoted to uh, different integration methods. So let's get into chapter two or section two of chapter seven, uh, trigonometric integrals. And since they're gonna become useful, let's just start with a kind of take an inventory of, of what we need. So what trig identities are there that you remember using at any point? And, and even if you just remember what they were called, even if you don't necessarily remember the actual, all the details of those identities, what do you remember using in the past? Y equals MX plus B. I mean, I mean, uh, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's what okay, I meant. So, got Pythagorean. All right, so that's a useful one. Does anybody remember a, a more specifically trigonometry uh, flavored version of uh, this identity? Sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. Yeah, so yeah, cosine, yeah, cosine squared of theta, or I'll just call it X. You know, this, this identity comes directly from the Pythagorean theorem. So this one's gonna be useful. Uh, anything else? So uh, when we say trig identities, would we include like double and like half angle identities? And yeah, absolutely. That, so um, let's make some headings for those. So a half angle. Uh, double angle. Uh, I'm going to start with the double angle identities, honestly, because I don't really remember what the half angle identities are. I just know that they come from the double angle identities. So the two big ones you're going to see are sine of 2x and cosine of 2x. Anyone happen to remember what sine of 2x is? 2 sine x cosine. Two what? Two sine x cos x. Yeah. I mean, I'm so sorry. My um, my mathematical vocabulary is. No, you're you're fine. I just uh, I just didn't understand. That's that's all it was. So yeah, sine of x equals two sine x cosine x. Cosine of two x has a few different uh, flavors we can look at. So cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x is one. And these other two are also true, but. Why? Why are these other two things valid as well? Because it's rewriting the cos square x and sine square x, right? Um, how am I rewriting? Um, in terms of that um, cos square x plus sine square x equals one. Yeah, exactly. So basically I am just using the Pythagorean identity and let's put some more details behind this. Um, you know, from this one identity, you can get a lot of other things that are going to end up being useful. So we can re-express sine squared of x. We can re-express cosine squared of x. And I'm betting that somebody's wondering it. Um, I'm not really a believer in making people memorize formulas. I will give you all these trig identities that are going to be useful. Um, on Tuesday. Um, it's up to you to kind of know when they're appropriate and when they're going to be most useful. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll give those to you. Um, speaking of deriving other things from Pythagorean identity, let me delete this underline. You know, what happens if I divide both sides of this equation? Sorry, Professor. Um... For cos 2x, 
Why why is it one minus two sine squared x not one minus? So basically what I did here was cosine squared of x. No, that's not the one I want to set up. So I know that cosine squared of x is also equal to one minus sine squared of x. So I can substitute out, I can substitute one minus sine squared of x in for cosine squared of x. Okay, yeah, that makes Sorry, I didn't see. Uh, I didn't see the minus. I I mean, like, the minus. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's. I mean, I did that to because I wanted someone to point out that that was why I was able to do that. Yeah, these. So these. The reason there are kind of three different, not really three different identities, because really all these things are equal, uh, but they're all consequences of. Um, the Pythagorean identity. Uh, so up here, if I divide by cosine squared, I get one plus tangent squared of x equals one over cosine squared, which is secant squared of x. Or I could start over and divide all those things by sine squared of x. And then that gives me cosine squared over sine squared, which is cotangent squared of x. Sine over sine squared x over sine squared of x is one. And one over sine squared of x is cosecant squared of x. And then from there, I'm not going to do it because I believe you could, but you could then isolate tangent squared or cotangent squared. So, um, and to be totally honest with you, the only one I really feel like I remember comfortably is cosine squared of x plus sine squared of x equals one. But a lot of valuable things uh, can be derived from that if you remember how to do it. All right, the half angle identities. Um, the half angle identities really just come from basically this family of uh, different looks at cosine of two x. Uh, and really, it's just the last two. So let's say, for example, I want, I'm just going to write it in terms of sine of x. And really, I'll let me, let me just derive one of them, and then I'll, we can kind of, uh, by parallel process, get the other one. So I know that cosine of 2x is equal to 1 minus 2 sine squared of x. But as a consequence of that, I could basically solve for sine of x. So then I get cosine 2x minus 1 equals negative 2 sine squared x. And then from there, I divide both sides by negative two. And I get one half of one minus cosine two X. Equals sine squared of X. And then finally square root. And because it took a square root, I had got to have plus and minus. Uh, like I said, I'll be giving you um, all these, basically anything that'll be useful in terms of these these identities, um, including the uh, the other half angle identity for uh, for cosine. Uh, but I just kind of want to take stock of the things we knew because we are going to be using them a lot for this this first section today. Uh, any other questions before we go on? 
All right. So I want to find the integral of cosine cubed. So we've seen some things recently, like we were doing substitution. Um, saw a lot of cases where, all right, I have a trig function raised to some power. That seems like a pretty good, good case for u substitution. Well, let's kind of, let's follow that to its logical conclusion here. If I do u equals cosine x, what does that mean about du dx? Equals sine x? Um, close, it'll be negative sine x. So here's the problem. Actually, maybe I should ask you what the problem is. Based on this du, why is substitution not going to help me that much? Would it be because it's negative? Oh, no, I mean, the negative is fine. I can, the negative would just be a constant multiple, so oh. I could I can manipulate those. Uh, would it be kind of like a problem, like from last night, where we're, um, we can't really simplify it completely, where? Yeah, I mean. Sorry, we, I'm just taking a while to get to. Get to no, I mean, it, really, it is a matter of me not being able to really not being able to transform it. So based on that u, I could call this u cubed. But then my dx is going to be this du over negative sine of x dx. Hold on. No, just like that. So I got u cubed du, but then I have this, you know, this negative sine x, and like, there's no real way I can, I can transform that to, uh, in terms of u. So substitution is not going to, not going to get me where I want to go. But what I can do here is I can rewrite this integrand. because I can use a trig identity that'll help me. So basically I'm factoring out the cosine squared and then I'm gonna transform that into one minus sine squared X cosine X dx. Is this something we can deal with? Let's go ahead and break it up as, as much as we can. <clears throat> Hopefully you see that this one is not going to be a problem. But how about the one on the right? Sine squared of x, cosine x, dx. Is that something we have the tools to integrate? I see at least one head nod. So what can we do to to handle this one, sine squared of x cosine squared x, or sorry, sine squared x cosine x dx. How can we handle that one? Make sine u, the u substitution. Let's try a so u substitution again, but now we have you know, different ingredients to use. If u is equal to sine of x, 
What is du equal to? Cosine x. Cosine x dx, which is kind of uh, the, the perfect thing for us. So let's go ahead and uh, keep on going. Uh, we know that the integral of cosine x is sine of x. We'll just get that one out of the way. And this one here, we're going to rewrite as u squared du. So what is the integral of u squared du? u cubed over three. Yep, u cubed over three plus c. And our last step is just to uh, back substitute. So we got sine of x minus one third sine cubed of x plus c. I'll go ahead and stop there. Any questions about this first one? All right, let's take a look at another one. <clears throat> so I got sine to the fifth of x, cosine squared of x dx. So one thing I'll point out here, and maybe you got a sense of it with that last example is, you know, we have these Pythagorean identities. And basically, and really, you know, we have more, but this is the, the primary one. What this identity allows us to do is we can trade two powers of sine for two powers of cosine or vice versa. Um, and really we can use that to, to help us solve these integrals. So I think you've probably got that we're gonna do that here, but my question to you is, should we transform some number of sines into cosines or we should, should we transform this cosine squared into sine squared? Which way should we go? Change the cosines to sine. Okay, so let's change the cosines to sines. So I guess sine to the fifth of x times one minus cosine squared of, or sorry, one minus sine squared of x dx. And if I break that up, I get sine to the fifth of x dx minus the integral of sine to the seventh of x dx. What do we think? Are we any closer? So this one, we're kind of we're going to kind of run to the same place as we were, you know, at the start of the last example. You know, I I could try to substitute. I could try to say u is equal to sine of x, but then I'm not going to get I'm not going to get that the my corresponding du term. Um, So one thing, let's ref let's go back to the last example for a bit and let me point something out. Um, when I factored out this cosine squared and transformed it into one minus sine squared, what did this, this leftover cosine x here? And specifically um, on the second integral, notice how valuable that cosine of x was for for allowing me to do u substitution that really 
enable me to use u substitution because I get my differential term out of it. So that cosine there, even though it ends up kind of disappearing, you know, it's hugely important for me setting up this integral. So same kind of idea over here. Um, I can transform my cosine squared. I'm totally allowed to do that, but then I don't, I don't have that, that remaining cosine to allow me to, to finish out that substitution. So let's do this. Let's uh, first rewrite our integrand is sine squared of x, uh, sine cubed of x, sine squared of x, cosine squared of x dx. And then we can rewrite. So we get sine cubed of x times one minus cosine squared of x times cosine squared of x dx. All right, what do we think about this? Did we get any closer this time? Let's think about it by jumping the gun a little bit. We would like to use u substitution because we understand that pretty well. If we were to use use, use u substitution here, what would be a good expression for u? How about this? What if I did u equals cosine of x? If I did u equals cosine of x, what does that mean for du? What is du going to be equal to? Negative sine x dx. Negative sine x dx. So I think this is a good goal for us. We would like to use u equals cosine x, but then we would need du to be negative sine of x. Right now we have sine cubed of x. So what can we do to basically get that sine, but only to the first power? Where can we go from here? Would you factor out another sine squared? Yep, and there's there's no limit to how many times we can do this. So sine of x, sine squared of x, one minus cosine squared of x, and then use the identity. All right. Now from there, are we in a good place to use U substitution based on this template we already set out? So I'm gonna tell you, yes, we are. So if we use U substitution, uh, walk me through what this integral is gonna become.
Um, sorry, go ahead. Well, it's going to be a one minus u squared. Okay. And then again, one minus u squared. And then u squared b. Okay. Or, yeah. So, negative d? Or? Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, we have to have a negative because in this case, du is equal to negative sine of x dx. So, yeah, we have to respect that negative sign. Uh, from here, we have a little bit of expanding to do. Um, putting these first two brackets together will become 1 minus 2u squared plus u to the fourth. And I probably should have paused a couple steps ago, but I'll go ahead and pause now. How are we doing with this, uh, this part of the process? Um, most importantly, with kind of how we built up to making this substitution happen. Really, the, the new wrinkle we're putting on this right now is, you know, bringing in these trig identities to rewrite our integrands so that they're something something we can work with okay. if we're okay with that then it's just a matter then of going through this integral so i've got negative one third u cubed plus two fifths u to the fifth minus one seventh u to the seventh plus c and then we said u was cosine Any questions about where we ended up here? Looks good. Good. All right, we'll go ahead and keep on going. <clears throat> All right, so now we got a definite integral of sine squared x. So we have a, an even number here, even number, an even power on sine of x. So yeah, we could we could trade that for one minus cosine squared, but that doesn't really help our situation. So this is one of those cases where those half angle identities are going to be most useful. So let's uh, I'll go ahead and remind you of them. So cosine of 2x is equal to you know, So we have these three different varieties here. And I know that I want to use this uh, to basically transform this integral into something I can, I can work with. So since the cosine, that double angle identity, cosine 2x, has uh, three, different, three different versions, not just a double angle here, which one of these should I, should I focus on? One, two, or three?
maybe two. Yeah, it looks like two because, you know, all I have to work with right now is sine squared of X. Um, so certainly that throws out three. I have no sine squared of X there to, to work with. Uh, one has sine squared of X in it, but it also has cosine squared of X, which is something, something else that I can't integrate directly. So now let's do a little pre-work before we get to the, the integral. I know the cosine of 2x is equal to 1 minus 2 sine squared x. And then from there, I can start manipulating. So basically what I have is this. I have the integral from zero to pi of, and I'll put the one half on the outside because I think it'll be a little bit easier to deal with. One minus cosine of two X dx. We agree with that. Do we understand why that's true? All right, is this integral something we can deal with directly? It looks pretty straightforward. Yeah, this one, yeah, now, now we're okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and take the antiderivative and then we can start evaluating. Antiderivative one, pretty straightforward. That's will just be x. Uh, the other one that might take a little bit of care is cosine 2x. What is the antiderivative of cosine 2x? Negative sine 2x. Negative sine 2x. Are we okay with that? Uh, shouldn't it be plus sine 2x? I think you're right on the, uh, on the negative sign the first time. Uh, like, doesn't cosine become negative sine, but because we're doing one minus negative sine? Or am I? Oh, I mean, wrong? you can handle the terms one at a time because they're added together. Oh. Okay. But so, one thing I wanted to do over here was let's go the opposite direction. If I were to take the derivative of sine of 2x, what would that be? Cosine 2x. Two cosine 2x. Yeah, but, but because of chain rule, um, I have to multiply this by 2. So this ends up being 2 cosine 2x. Two so because of that, when we're doing this antiderivative, what's missing from this sine of 2x here? Two. Not two, because remember, we're going, we're doing an inverse process here. One half. Should be one half. And just because I think we're all more comfortable with differentiation, let's take the derivative of one half sine of 2x. That'll be basically one half times cosine of two X. And then because of chain rule, I'll have this multiplied by two and that those factors end up canceling. So just a reminder um, here in particular, but just in general, look out for uh, consequences of chain rule when you are uh, 
take an antiderivative. So basically, anytime you have a composite function, make sure you're handling all of your, your inner and outer functions correctly. This should be the antiderivative. I'll go ahead and rewrite one more time to clean it up a little bit. X minus one half sine two X. And then from here, it's just a matter of, you know, the calculus is more or less done. At least the integral is. Now it's just a matter of uh, evaluating this at the endpoints or at the limits of integration. So you get one half uh, times pi minus one half sine two pi minus zero minus one half sine of zero. What is the sine of two pi? Zero. Zero. Minus zero. And the sine of zero is also zero. So that ends up just being pi over two. I suppose like I'm just still a little bit unclear of like um, if it's one minus cos two uh, cosine two x. Yep. Then the antiderivative. I, I, actually, never mind. Um, Are you sure? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, really, I can try to. I think I know what you're after. If I can squeeze in a negative sign on both of these, really the only consequence that's going to have is that it's going to basically negate everything we did. But really none of the, it's not going to change anything else about the derivative or the antiderivative. Um, so if you prefer, and you can definitely split these up, So yeah, if you like to kind of unclutter things, that that is also a good starting place, and it'll it'll get you to the same place of pi over two. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions here? All right. All right. So now we got the. Um, our reciprocal trig identities getting involved. So start with our primary. Um, a Pythagorean identity. And uh, and I'm really I'm doing I really never remember what the the other two are, but I know I can derive them by dividing everything here by cosine squared. And that gives me one plus tangent squared of X equals secant squared of X. And are you looking back on the last examples we did where, you know, you can, you can trade the sine squared for a cosine squared, essentially. You can trade, a, what I mean by that, you can trade two powers of sine for two powers of cosine and vice versa. And now we're seeing from this other identity, we can trade two powers of tangent for two powers of secant and vice versa. Uh, with sine and cosine, um, if, you, if it didn't kind of jump out at you, and if it didn't, that's fine. We've only done a couple of these, but 
Um, basically, whichever one of those powers is odd is going to help you a lot because you know you need to have one more power of sign. As you can see, you don't really have that. You don't really have that guidance here. Both of these powers are, are going to be there. Both these powers are even. So it pays to remember these two things. What is the derivative of tangent of x? And what is the derivative of secant of x? Anyone remember off the top of their head? Is the derivative of secant of x secant tangent? Derivative of secant of x is secant x tangent x. And tangent is? C squared x. Secant squared x. So these two derivatives, because basically it's, I mean, if you've probably seen by now, we're in a lot of cases, we're going to be building up to u substitution. So whatever we want to take the integral of, um, you know, basically whatever we choose for our, our, our expression for u, uh, we also need to be able to construct our differential as well. So we know the derivative of tangent is secant squared. We know the derivative of secant is secant tangent. Does that give anybody any clues as to whether we should start transforming secants into tangents or tangents into secants? I mean, tangents to secants. Uh, Let's try that. So if we do that, then let's start by factoring out. So we get tangent to the six of x, secant squared x, secant squared x, dx. And I get tangent to the sixth x times one plus tangent squared x, secant squared x, dx. And I'll do one more move here. Tangent to the six of X plus tangent to the eighth of X. Secant squared X DX. So what do we think about that decision? Did it help us get where we want to go? Um, yeah, actually you could take um, 10 X X U and the other one, it would just become um, just. So yeah, I think, I think you trailed off a little bit, but yeah, you're totally right. U is equal to tangent X. And, you know, based on what we already said on the left here, if U is equal to tangent of X, then DU is going to be equal to secant squared of X DX. Which yeah. that's that's it. That's going to unlock the rest of this. So through u substitution, we're going to get the integral of u to the sixth plus u to the eighth. This whole thing becomes du. And yeah, changing so transforming or trading two powers of tangent for two powers of secant was absolutely the real, most effective way to go there. Any questions on how we did that? Uh, specifically, how that choice was made? Is, is that for me? Oh, uh, no, just anybody, I mean, anybody at all. All right, if we're okay with this, then we can keep on integrating. This becomes one seventh u to the seventh plus one ninth u to the ninth plus c 
and then we undo the substitution. You know, it's it's totally okay if we if we if we take like say x ten x that way, but it's just gonna be a two steps longer, I guess. Um, let's think about that. So, if let's say we decided to start trading out tangents, keep in mind that if you wanted to set it up that way, you would have to have you know secant to the one and tangent to the one. And since, you know, Pythagorean identity is nice, but really the only thing it allows us to do is to uh, deal in powers of two. And since these powers are both even, I don't, it's not going to be possible. Basically, if all you can do is add and subtract two to those, those powers, they're never going to become odd. They're never going to become one. So because of that, this is, I think the way you chose, Rias, is really the only way we could have gone. Is it is it impossible or is it or is it just that it's hard? I am fairly certain it's impossible. Okay. Um, I, I can dig a little more into that, but I I'm convinced it's impossible, but I can, and yeah, we can definitely talk about it more if you want um, after class. Sure. Any more questions on this example here? All right. So now, looks very similar. Um, I'll go ahead and remind us of these facts here. So just to kind of compare this and contrast this with our, our last example, both of our powers on tangent and secant were even, and in this one, they're both odd. So if again, we're gonna be marching towards u substitution, we either need, need to be trying to get secant to, to the power of two, or we need to get secant to the power of one times tangent to the power of one. Those are the things we should be aiming for. So based on what we're allowed to do with the Pythagorean identity, are we gonna be able to get this secant to the seventh? Are we gonna be able to get that to the power of two? So because all you're able to do is trade powers of two, I mean, I can change this secant to the seventh. I can get this down to five or three or one. But I, I have no hope of, uh, of getting that to the, um, getting that to the power of, uh, of two. So because of that, what I'm really aiming for is this secant x tangent x. And because of that, I'm gonna go ahead and factor one of each out. 
So I'm going to change this integral to tangent to the fourth of x times secant to the sixth of x times secant x tangent x dx. I'm going to go ahead and stop there because it, it seems like that might have might have caused some some confusion. So let me ask this: Are are we okay with my? Am I am I have I convinced you that getting this to appear in my integral is is not going to be possible? Yeah, you get some odd terms. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. I'm kind of, you know, let's let's so let's set that up like that was my goal. I'll do it here at the bottom. If I factor out a secant squared, then I would have tangent to the fifth of x, secant to the fifth of x times secant squared. So then from here, to complete this goal, I'm going to have to get tangent to some power. It doesn't matter what power tangent has on it. I'll be able to use u substitution. But because I can only I can only use Pythagorean identity to, to swap out powers of secant in pairs. You know, you can't subtract even numbers from an odd number and ever get to zero. It's not gonna work. Uh, so because of that, we're kind of, we're stuck with this. So we know we're trying to get to a place where we have secant x tangent x, that basically this right here is gonna become our du. That's our goal. And to get this as a du, what does my term for u need to look like? Now let's go ahead and write it out u equals unknown, du, du equals secant x, tangent x, dx. If this is what du looks like, or if this is what du is, then what must u be? Secant x. Secant x, yes. Basically, another way to phrase that is, what is the antiderivative of secant x tangent x? The only, the, the only answer to that question is secant of x. So, we got our du, we're gonna try to fill in u. Because of that, so what do I need to do with this stuff? How do I need to start manipulating tangents of the fourth secant to the sixth? to be able to enable u substitution. Change the tangents to secants. I need the tangents to become secants. Basically, yeah, I, I can't have tangents anymore. So to do that, if I revise this Pythagorean identity, I know that tangent squared of x is equal to secant squared of x minus one. So from here, I'll go ahead and do this in, uh, in one shot. Secant squared of x minus one times secant squared of x minus one times secant x tangent x dx. So hopefully you're recognizing now that my u substitution just became available to me. And I can start putting those things in. So it'll be u squared minus one, u squared minus one. And then this whole thing, like we said before, is du. I think you forgot the secant to the six. I absolutely did. Thank you.
Good catch, Colin. Anything else? Uh, any other questions on where we are right now? Right now. All right, from here, we should do a little bit of expanding. I'll go ahead and pause there. Partly to see if you have any questions, partly because I've already made one mistake, so there could be others. Anybody have any thoughts here? Okay. Oh. All right, so we got the integral of tangent cubed. So any thoughts on how to start this one? Factor out a tangent. Okay. So if we factor out a tangent, tangent x times tangent squared of x. All right. What does that allow us to do? Ten, I don't know if it would, I don't think it would be helpful that tan squared of x could become secant squared minus one. Okay, so tangent squared of x times secant squared of x minus one. I better put a dx in here. So that is certainly true, but is it helpful? What do we think? Is that gonna get a is that did that get us closer to the goal? I think it gets us further away. I was just like, you know. Well, let's kind of think. Let's um. And here's a piece of advice that I, I recommend. I think it's a little overwhelming to keep all these things together and look at it all at once. And hopefully, it's not quite as uh, overwhelming to split them up when you can which you can always do if you have things added together. So I got tangent x secant squared of x dx minus the integral of tangent of x dx. So let's think about it. Is this left-hand integral something we can handle?
I'll go ahead and spoil it for you. Both of these are, are doable. So yeah, transforming, uh, basically those first two steps were great. So how do I integrate tangent X times secant squared of X? You could just split it, I guess, and just take X becomes U and DU. Uh, sorry, what'd you say U is equal to? Seek X. So if U is equal to secant X, then what's DU equal to? Seek X and X. Are we okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to tell you the truth. I this is not what I was expecting, but I think it I think it has to work. So let's let's keep on going. So in this case, this integral becomes u du, which is just one half u squared, which is equal to one half of secant squared of x. Uh, and you know what this is? I'll tell you right now, I was expecting this to be one half tangent squared of X, which is obviously not, uh, but this is going to be correct and I'll explain why when we're done. But uh, this is really interesting. I haven't thought about this before. All right, so that one's done. This one is a little more mysterious. Does anybody remember how to one, It's just oh. one by you. Does anybody remember what the integral of tangent x is or how to do it? I think it would just be one by you, right? Um, because, no, because it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be yeah. a, in fact, I think it um, helps for this one to rewrite it as sine of x over cosine x. Um, Professor? Yeah. We could actually like multiply and divide by sec x thing. Sec x, sec x by sec x. Then sec x is like u, sec x tan x, dx is like du. It becomes this one by u. So you want to multiply the right, this integral by sec x? Yeah. Okay, let me see that. And you're absolutely right. That would become du over u, which is not a coincidence. So let me let's do this over here. If I have the integral of sine x over cosine x, um, let's say u is equal to cosine x. That means du would be equal to negative sine x dx, and then this becomes. negative du over u. There's something, it's, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out why I'm off by a negative, a factor of negative one, because I, I, I don't see any, any flaw in what you did there. Well, is this what you were building to on the left-hand side over here, or, or is this something different? Uh, the, no, I'm basically, I'm basically handling these integrals uh, independently of each other. Okay. But yeah, they, they don't really, uh, they don't really hinder each other. I'll go ahead and finish this one out. This should, should be negative natural log of u which is negative natural log of, oh, you know what? I figured it out and I'll explain that as well. Yeah, Rhea said a couple of really interesting wrinkles in this for me, but they're, that's really cool. 
So negative natural log of cosine of x. But the way Arias did it is going to become positive natural log of sine of x or of uh, secant of x. Now, if you remember back to your the way logarithms work, the way you can manipulate them, I can take a multiplied constant on a logarithm and just make that a power on the argument. So I can, this is equal to natural log of cosine X to the negative one, which is equal to natural log of one over cosine X, which cool. is equal to the natural log of secant X. So yeah, I mean, absolutely different approaches, but yeah, you're, if they're correct, they have to wind up in the same place. This is um, um, I'm a bit curious. Like changing things a little bit changes it, it almost everything. Like the, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it changes the way it looks, but it's absolutely, it's absolutely still equal. So I got one half secant squared x, um, plus natural log of secant of x. And that should be absolute value plus C. Now I told you when that happened, when uh, with this unforeseen development over here, what I was really building up to was this, and I'll put it above here, the integral of tangent X secant squared X. I thought we were going to do u equals tangent x and du equals secant squared of x dx. And then this just becomes the integral of u du, which is, again, one half u squared, which in our case is one half tangent squared x. Now, the reason I can put one half secant squared x in here or one half tangent squared x in here is because of this. Let's actually go ahead and transform this so it has a tangent in it. So this becomes one half times um, is it tangent squared plus one? Now what happens if I distribute, I get one half tangent squared of X plus a half plus natural log of the absolute value of secant X plus C. But here's the thing about this, this constant of integration C, I have no idea what it is. So really it makes no difference if I group these constants together. An unknown constant plus a known constant I mean, I can, I can really just have the unknown constant absorb it. So this is the answer that I thought we were going to get to in a pretty straightforward way. Um, we got some, we got to something that looked a little different, but they're, they're both absolutely correct, even though they look quite different. Any questions here? I'm so, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't be sorry. I think that's really cool. That was interesting. No, it's just that went it way off. <laughs> no, it didn't. I mean, we, we, and I, and I know, I, I know I've said a few times we did not, this did not happen the way I expected. That is absolutely not a criticism. I'm totally okay with it. Uh, any more questions about example six here? All right, uh, we had one more example, but we've, this section's run a little bit long and the other one's very, the last one's very similar to this one. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave it. Uh, we've been at this for about an hour, 15 minutes. Um, 
let's go ahead and get a little bit into the next section and then we'll take a break. Save those. So if anybody's been looking at the book, you probably noticed a, a section three, which I don't think is really value added. So we're gonna do, move on to four. So this section's all about um, uh, rational functions. So rational functions are basically, you know, you know what a polynomial is. A rational function is uh, the quotient of a polynomial and another polynomial. So basically, how do we integrate these things? And really, to integrate things like this, we have to do a little bit of pre-work. Um, because what we're going to do here is we're going to rewrite this rational function as uh, a sum of simpler things. And as we go through here, I'm going to give you some, some advice that kind of shows up organically. So number one, look at degree of numerator. And while I'm writing this down, let's remind ourselves, what does it mean? What, what is the degree of a polynomial? Well, yeah, what's the, what's the degree of a polynomial? Just the highest um, uh, exponent. Highest, yeah. yeah, it's the highest exponent. So, and I'll give you a little more here. Now I'm gonna call this capital N and I'll call this capital D. If N is at least as big as D, then we have to do long division. And in this case, we do have the situation where the degree of the numerator is higher than the degree of the denominator. So this may not be something you've done all that recently. So I'll give you a little bit of a refresh here. So we're going to divide x cubed plus x, and I'm basically I'm I'm filling in placeholders for any powers of x that aren't represented. I'm going to divide that by x minus one. And now let's just kind of take a straw poll here. Does anybody remember how to go through this? Um. So we would start by doing x squared times x minus one. Yeah, so. And then subtracting. Yep, so I know that if I divide x into x squared, x cubed, I get x squared. And then like Alistair said, I'm gonna multiply this x squared by this, by my divisor. So that becomes x cubed minus x squared. And remember, when you're doing this, you subtract. So this cancels x cubed minus x cubed. This becomes positive x cubed. All right, then what happens from here? Is it, does it just drop? Yep. So this term drops down. And that's basically, you know, you do this process for every power of x. We've basically gone through this loop one time. So now I divide x into x squared. So that becomes x. Multiply by x and I get x squared. x times negative one is negative x. And I subtract and I get two x bring down the zero. Divide x into two x, I get two. Two times x is two x. Two times negative one is negative two. And then my last subtraction here will give me the remainder.
So basically what I've gotten so far, and I'm going to leave the integral off of it because I haven't done any calculus yet. I've just done long division. I know x cubed plus x divided by x minus one is x squared plus x plus two. And then we have to deal with the remainder plus two over x minus one. How are we doing with that? All right, so now we've essentially traded in the integral that I gave you into this new one that has a lot of different terms in it. So x squared plus x plus two plus two over x minus one. And if you're okay with this, tell me how to, tell me what the integral of this thing looks like. So it would be x to the three over three. Yep. Plus, uh, or yeah, yeah, plus uh, x to the second over two. Plus two x. Um, and then I'll be uh, be two x um uh, forgetting what you do with the polynomial uh because i feel like that's to the negative one yep so you are right that this last term is essentially i'll rewrite it down here two times the integral of one over x minus one dx What do those things end up looking like? The two times the natural log of x minus one? Yep. And to be technical, it's the absolute value of x minus one. But that's it. Basically, that long division step allowed us to trade our rational function that was very cluttered into four much simpler integrals. Any questions there? All right, let's keep on going. All right. So first thing to look for is the respective degrees of the numerator and denominator. Is the degree of the numerator at least as big as the degree of the denominator? It's not. Not this time. So I get to avoid that step. But now from here, and you're going to see a trend, I'm going to start all these off by, you know, I'm not even going to carry that integral with me. I am going to, I mean, really the first step is to, really the, the majority of these is breaking them down into smaller fractions. So I can factor out an X from here and I get two X squared plus three X. Minus two. Does this factor any further? Um, I think it's uh, x minus one squared. Or actually, no, sorry. No, nope, not with a factor of two.
just a little refresh. You there? There's probably a lot of or Rias. Do you have something? Yeah, you could actually complete this word, and then uh, plus plus one minus one, and then you'll have x plus one the whole square minus one of this. I'm sorry. Can you can you say what the final factor factoring was? I, I missed okay. it. Okay. Okay. You would uh, the down one or the top one? Uh, no, oh, no, no. The... We're we're just we're just factoring the um the denominator. Oh, sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Um, all right, so the way I th I think is the simplest way to, to handle these, I know that two times negative two is negative four. So I wanna find numbers that I want A times B equals negative four, and I want A plus B equals three, the coefficient of my middle term. So what A and B fit the mold there? Um, plus four, uh, plus four X minus one. Yeah, so Next. A equal four, B equals minus one. Um, so from here, this might be a little longer way around than you're used to, but especially when you have that, that leading term has a coefficient that's not one. I feel like it requires a little, a little extra care. So basically, I'm just going to rewrite that middle term, 3x, as 4x minus x. And then I'm going to factor both pairs. So I factor out a 2x from the first one, x plus 2 minus x plus 2. 2x minus 1 times x plus 2. And now I have three linear factors. And I'll pause there. Because this factoring is really the key to the rest of this. Any questions about how we wound up there? So I have three factors. On the in the denominator, all three of those factors are linear, so the the degree on each one of those factors is one. So here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to assume that this rational function is the sum of three smaller fractions like this. And I'm going to try to find out what those A, B, and C are. Because if I can do that, then instead of integrating this nasty rational function, I get to integrate three much simpler rational functions. All right, so next step in this process is this. I wanna clear all these fractions out. So I am going to multiply, actually I'm gonna rewrite this so I can have enough room to show what I need to do. I'm gonna multiply both sides by this fully factored denominator. So when I do that, a lot of good things happen. This cancels out, so I get x squared plus 2x minus 1 equals 
on this first term, the x's are going to cancel, but I'm still going to have a times 2x minus 1, x plus 2. For this middle term, the 2x minus 1s are going to cancel. So this will be b times x times x plus 2. And for the last term, I'm going to have c times x times 2x minus 1. All right, now from here, I would like to expand all my brackets on the right-hand side. So this will be equal A times 2X squared. There's X plus 2X. Oh, plus 4X. Actually, you know what, let's, let's be a little quicker about it. So 2a x squared. And please, please check me. I'm doing a lot of things here and I could definitely miss something. Well, let me stop there for a second. All right, one last thing I'm gonna do. I'm gonna group everything on the right by powers of X. So if I factor out an X squared from everything that is multiplied by X squared, I get 2A plus B plus 2C. And then how about X? Then I'm gonna have 3A plus 2b minus c. And then all the constant terms, everything that's free of x. Negative 2a. Is that it? Yeah, there's, that's it. So from here, basically, I'm going to have a system of three equations. So realizing that what's on the left-hand side of the equal sign has to equal what's on the right-hand side, what must 2a plus b plus 2c, what must that be equal to? One. That must be equal to one. So I'm going to go ahead and just start this system of equations. 2a plus b plus 2c equals one. And Mona Lisa, how did you know that that was equal to one? Because on the left hand side, the coefficient of x squared is one. So then all that quantity should equal one to equal the coefficient. That's exactly it. The, the, the coefficients on the left and right hand side of the equal sign have to be the same. So because of that, I know that 3a 
plus 2B minus C better be equal to 2. And the, the one that's going to really save us from a lot of uh, complicated algebra is that negative 2A has to be equal to negative 1. So really, A equals a half. And since we have A equals a half, we get to transform this system of equations into a two by two. So I believe this becomes B plus two C equals zero. And two B minus C equals uh, one half. Two minus one and a half, yeah. Any questions here so far? I'm going to go ahead and rearrange. This really becomes B equals negative 2C. And now let's do this. Negative 4C minus C equals a half. Negative 5C equals a half then C equals negative one over 10. Which from there, I think we get B equals positive one over five. All right, any questions there? All right, so now that we have those three constants, basically we get to trade our original integral, this nasty rational function, in for this one. The integral of, and this is going to look a little irregular, but it's a little, little more uh, simple to deal with. The integral of one-half over x plus the integral of one half over two X minus one. And then the last one is one tenth minus one over 10 over X plus two. And from here, the process is, a little, is, is pretty straightforward, but I do want to stop here because, you know, this, this partial fraction decomposition, which we just, you know, we basically covered the slide with, this really is the, the bulk of this, of this technique, is, is knowing, knowing the ins and outs of that process. So please ask me any questions there if you have. All right. If there are no questions. What is the, now let's start integrating these one at a time. What's the uh, antiderivative of one half over X? Half log minus. Yeah, one half natural log of x, absolute value of x. 
All right, how about the next one? Um, two by five. So it sounded like you multiplied there. It's actually going to be. Oh, OK. Divide, yeah. Yeah. This one is actually going to be, and I might need to pause for that one because that one might be a little mysterious, but that one's going to be one-tenth, the natural log of 2x minus 1. Uh, look, actually, why don't I go ahead and finish it, and then we can pause at the end for questions, and then minus 1 over 10, natural log of x plus 2. Let's see. If this question comes in the exam, like how 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 many how many how many questions like this will be there? I mean, I mean, so let me so I'll say, look how long this took us. Um, obviously, I know how long these take, so I I will, you know, I can't I can't throw you twenty of these and expect you to get them done in ninety minutes. Um, having said that, we are going to take a break. Uh, and when we come back, I will show you uh, another way of doing these that I think is more streamlined um, and faster, and hopefully you agree. Uh, but yeah, don't despair. They're, they don't usually take this long. So let's go ahead and take a break. Uh, I have 7.52. Let's come back at 8.02. And we'll go ahead and do a few more examples of these.
All right, I hope everyone's back. Let's go ahead and get back to it. So our next example here, uh, like I said, I'm gonna think about this independent of the integral. So we really have one over x squared minus 25. So, do we have to do that long division step before we get any further? Yeah, I see a couple of head shakes. No, not this time. Uh, so, what we'd like to do now is we would like to factor the denominator as, as fully as we can. So how does x squared minus 25 factor? x plus five times x minus five. Yep, x plus five, x minus five. So still have two linear factors. I'm gonna try the same things I tried last time. I'm gonna break this up into two different fractions. One with each linear factor as its denominator. So this A over X plus five plus B over X minus five, this is, this is kind of our, our skeleton for our partial fraction decomposition. Where should we go from here? using our previous examples as kind of a, a jumping off point. Multiply both sides by X plus five and X minus five. Very good. So go ahead and rewrite again. So one over X plus five, X minus five. This is all all for the purpose of clearing out fractions. So left-hand side is gonna become one. Right-hand side is gonna become A times X minus five plus B times X plus five. So what we did last time from here is basically expand everything on the right, uh, collect terms for every power of X that we have and use the corresponding coefficients to, um, to figure out what our unknown constants are. So I'm gonna show you something a little differently here that I, I think is a, is a preferable way to do it, but um, if you like, you can always go back to the first way I showed you. And this all relies upon the fact that A and B are unknown, but they are not variables. They are constants. I just don't know what they are. But they are the same no matter what my value of X is. So if I can figure out a value of X, if I can carefully pick a value of X that will make this equation appear easier to solve, then that's what I wanna pick. Um, specifically, I would like to pick a value of X that will make either A or B vanish. So is there a value of X that you can think of that would make that happen? Zero. So if I do zero. I'm sorry, I meant, um, yeah. Um, what? I think someone else said five. Was, oh, you're, okay. Yeah. Let's go back. So if I do X equals five, then what I get is this. 
one equals a times five minus five plus b times five plus five. And that's exactly what we wanted to happen. So now I get one equals 10b. Which means that b is equal to one over 10. Could I do that again? You could do it with negative, negative five. five. Yep, I can do the same thing with negative five. And then I'm gonna get one equals basically negative 10a and the b would vanish. So then from there, I get A equals negative one over 10. So this is not apples to apples comparison um, with uh, our previous example, because our, our last example was a lot more complicated. We, I mean, we had uh, three different constants to solve for. Um, this is only two. I mean, you can, you can solve a system of two equations uh, pretty quickly by now, um, but I am probably going to use this method more often than the other, but uh, they're both totally valid. I just, I happen to think this was a little quicker. So from here, I have my two constants for A and B, which means now I get to look at a different integral. So the integral of negative one over 10 over X plus five plus one over 10 over x minus five. And how do we feel about that? All right, so help me with these, uh, help me with the integral here. What does this become? Would it help if I did this? Remember, I can factor out constants. So I'm hoping that you're with me on that. I'm not I'm not hearing a lot of a lot of input, but please, please, please ask me a question here if you have one. I was still kind of uh, confused. For example, two, why the middle part was um, one over ten. Like for example, two though, the last example. Yeah, let's go back. Just All right. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, you're good. So this middle term here, and I wish I had more room to work, but I'll have to make this do. Let's pull apart this middle one. I'll, I'll factor out the one fifth. One fifth times one over two x minus one dx. Um. And really from here, let's, 
I think that maybe the easiest way for everyone to see it would be if I did U substitution. So I'll do U equals 2X minus 1, which means DU is going to be equal to 2DX. Which means DX is going to be equal to half DU. So then from there, I'm going to have one half times the integral of one over u times one over two du which if i just bring out that half bring that half out of the integral as well i'm going to have one tenth times the integral of du over u Okay. Does that make sense, Mona Lisa? Okay. And I ran out of room, but that D over U is D U over U is going to become the natural log of U. And then when we back substitute, we'll get to the same place. Oh, I don't want to go that fast. All right. Um, how about this one? Are we okay with uh our final results or any of the steps that led up to it? Oh, so if you take X equals minus five, the same thing applies, right? Like the minus yeah. of Ellen yeah. is just that. Um, I'm not, maybe I'm not sure what you're asking. Are you talking about the, the, the final integral there? No, 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 like, um, how would it change if you're sort of like taking X equals Okay, that works out. Are you sure? Are you sure? Mm. I'm sorry, I mean, I, I sort of missed, uh, basically I heard X equals and then I I, I lost. I'm, I'm, well, I'm trying to understand how, how it's gonna change, like if it take X equals minus five in the first place, um, um, then, then B is gonna get, cancel then you're gonna get the same thing yeah so and just to reiterate the reason i'm allowed to do that is because you know a and b are always so now that we know what they are we can talk about that a is equal to one over, negative one over 10 and b is equal to one over 10 regardless of what x is equal to so if that's true i might as well just pick values of x that like for example, if I pick X equals five, then that makes the value of A irrelevant because I can just, um, it's gonna vanish and I can just deal with B. Similarly for X equals negative five, that'll make B vanish and I can just deal with A. All right, let's go to another one. All right, so this, this nasty rational function. What should I do first? Divide. And why do I have to do that? Because it's, it looks very, um, It looks very tempting, I guess. Okay. Uh, can someone give me a little more specific why I have to do it the division step first? Because the power in the numerator is greater than the power in the... Right. So yeah, it's all about the degrees of the numerator and denominator. So in this case, degree in the numerator is... And I just want to... We haven't seen it yet, but it's not just that the, the degree in the numerator is, is larger. It's that it's at least as large. If they're the same, you still have to do this. So divide this by a cubic. So we get x cubed minus x squared minus x plus one. 
So divide x cubed into x to the fourth, you get x. Then multiply that through x to the fourth minus x cubed minus x squared plus x. Subtract. So uh, please give me a sanity check. Let me know if you see something wrong, but I believe we, I believe this whole thing is the same as X plus one plus four X over X cubed minus X squared minus X plus one. Um, I was wondering when you do long division for fraction or polynomials, um, and you put in the zero for like kind of like the placeholders in the. Yep. Do you also do that for the one outside? I forgot what it's called. The uh, divisor. Yeah. Yes, you do. You do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, anywhere where there are. Um, yeah, basically you have to represent every. Uh, every power of x from the degree down to zero. It's a good question. All right, anyone remember how to factor this uh, this cubic down here? Or anybody have any ideas? Can take x outside. Um, not really because oh, no, of this one. Oh no, but what about just take the x outside and... Um, mm, I have one more. No, it won't work. So one thing that you may not have seen for a while is a technique called factoring by grouping. And I'll just kind of write this off at the bottom to so I have my cubic, the four terms of my cubic in descending order of power. So let's split them up into two groups and try to factor each pair. So I have x cubed minus x squared. I can factor out an x squared from both of those. Then I get x minus one. And if I factor out a negative one from these next two, I'll get x minus one. So factoring by grouping is one of those things that doesn't always work. In fact, it doesn't usually work, but um, in this case, I think it does. Because now I've factored, basically I've rewritten these four terms into two, and those two terms have a common factor, which is x minus one. So I get x plus one plus four x over, x squared minus one times x minus one. But professor, how are we gonna do that? Um, that A, B stuff? Uh, we're actually not ready to do that yet. Because we can factor this one even more, can't we? Oh yeah, yeah. So we have a perfect okay. square or a difference of perfect squares. So now we can do X plus one, X minus one, X minus one. And then last thing I'm gonna do here is to collect 
x plus one, x minus one squared. So this is a new a new case we're looking at here, uh, and this this one's going to break down a little a little differently. So I'm going to leave the x the x plus one alone, and we're doing partial fraction decomposition. So really, we just have to decompose the thing, the the rational function part of our expression. And I will give you the way this decomposes, and then we'll talk about why that's the case. But I have four x over x plus one times x minus one squared. That is equal to a over x plus one plus b over x minus one plus c over x minus one squared. And the case we're looking at here, I'll make a note here. This is called a repeated factor. So our denominator factored into, into three linear factors, x plus one, x minus one, and x minus one. But we have something repeated. So Think about what the process of partial fraction decomposition is. We're taking a complicated rational function and we're breaking it apart into multiple simpler rational functions. But think about if you were going the opposite way. What if you started with these simple, these simple pieces? So this, the A and the B and the C here. Actually, let's, let's, let's suppose you didn't even have those, those other simple pieces. Let's just say you had this four X over X plus one times X minus one squared. If you think about the, the algebraic fractions you had that you were gonna add together to get that common denominator, Think about what all the different, um, what all the different, you know, individual rational functions could be to give you that common denominator. Because let's say, let's suppose that, you know, we left this out and we try to just do the partial fraction decomposition this way. We're not guaranteed in this case then to ever, to ever find and A and C that'll work for us. Because maybe the, maybe the fractions that got added together were one over X plus one plus three over X minus one squared minus two over X minus one. So since we don't know, you know, basically we can't assume that any of these powers are missing. So when you have a repeated factor like that, like let's say this was x minus one to the 10th, I would need to have another, another uh, rational function for each of those 10 powers. Because maybe, maybe all powers from one to 10 are represented. So this is our, a, a new special case of, these, uh, of this example or of this process. So from here, what should I do next? Multiply both sides by the denominator. Yep. Multiply both sides by the denominator. And I'll Maybe abbreviate this a little more now that we've done a few. Left hand side will become 4x. This will become a times x minus 1 squared. This will become b times x minus 1 
x plus one. And this becomes c times x plus one. Um, professor. Um, yes, sir. Good. Uh, it's just, just that that um um, can you, well, why can't you sort of like take x plus one and x minus one square? Like, uh, just that one more time, please. Um, why can't I do what? Take the take the. Yeah, go ahead and ask your question again. I'm sorry. Okay, it's just a by x plus one and then b by x minus one the whole square. But like that makes in intuitive sense, right? Like. Yep. So, yeah, let's, so basically you're asking, why can't I just do that? Yeah, just, just um, know. let me hold that question until we're done. Actually, I'll give you a, I'll give you an answer now. And, and I think I'll be able to even, even give you more clarity when we're done. Sure, but sure, sure. Um, basically, if you do this, we are not guaranteed to ever find a combination of A and B that work. Um, because we might be missing something. If we go at it like this, you know, maybe we find that B is equal to zero. And if we find that B is equal to zero, then that means we could have gotten away with just the, the A term and the C term. But that's that's a little bit of a gamble. You know, that would only work yeah. out if that middle term was not there. But, what but I don't, is, sorry, go ahead, Rios. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, what, what I don't really understand is if we have X minus one squared, why don't we, um, why don't we flush that out to x plus one, x minus one, and then have an additional uh, d term? You know what I mean? So, and that's a good question. And really, when we're doing, when we start this partial fraction decomposition, we want to have this in a place where it is as factored as possible. So let's say we, let's say we had this, not b d over x plus one, x minus one. That is, th then this would not be as factored as possible because, you know, the terms I would add together to give me this d, it would be something over x plus one plus something over x minus one, which I already have included. Right, but well, kind of what I'm asking is why wouldn't it be C over X minus one and D over X plus one, not D over X plus one times X minus one. Okay, so, well, right now, I think we have all of our factors covered because I mean, the X plus one, there's only one of those. That's that's pretty simple. Um, but then really we we need, Really, because we have no idea where we're going to end up, we need we need one factor for the linear x minus one and one factor for the quadratic x minus one. Because really, the the individual rational functions that added together that add together to make four x over x plus one x minus one squared, there might be two of them, there might be three of them, um, but really. Really, what we're doing is we're planning for every contingency. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so from here, so let's go back to choosing our strategic values of X. What's a good value of X to try? Plus one. one. Okay, so I got x equals one. That means that I'll have four times one equals uh, the a term will vanish, the b term will vanish, and we'll have c times two. 
So that means we get C equals two. All right, can we do that again? All right, if we do X equals negative one, then we get four times negative one equals A times negative one minus one squared. Uh, the B term will vanish, the C term will vanish. So that means we get negative four equals four A. So we get A equals negative one. All right, can we do that again? Yes. What other X value can we use, Rios? Um, oh, no, no, uh, you used it. Yeah, so, and there's the thing, it looks like we can't do that method again because I can't, basically I can't uh, keep B all by itself. But keep in mind, how many unknowns do we have left? Do I really have three unknowns anymore? There's just one left. There's only one left. So really, I can choose whatever I want. I'm going to choose zero because it's kind of the simplest to deal with. If I choose x equals zero, what I get is this. 4 times 0 equals A times 1 plus B times negative 1 plus C times 1. But what I really have is 0 equals negative 1 minus B plus 2. So B should be equal to 1. Uh, so Rias, I think now that we have this, I can go back to your question. So now let's let's lay out the whole integral. We can't forget the x and the one that we had from our division. So the integral of x plus one uh, minus one over x plus one plus one over x minus one plus one over x minus one squared dx. So here's what we found. Um, we found that a was equal to negative one, b was equal to one, and c was equal to two. Uh, but more importantly, what we found is that that is the only combination of a, b, and c that will add together to give you that 4x over x plus one times x minus one squared. Um, and we're not going to go through it just because it would, it would take a little bit of time. But uh, if you're not convinced, I, I would advise going through this. Try to set this up using the same partial fraction decomposition, except take out that middle term. Um, and I think you probably won't have to go too far to figure out that it won't work. You will not be able to get this done without some fraction that looks like something over x minus one. All right, any other uh, questions about how we got to this place? All right, then it's time to start integrating. So, First couple of terms are pretty straightforward. One half x squared plus x. Uh, how about negative one over x plus one? When is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus one? Minus the natural log, absolute value of x plus one. 
And then, how about the next one? The natural log of the absolute value of x minus one. Yep. And this last one. If you're not sure, I would advise writing it like this. X minus one to the negative two. What is it? Negative one over three times X minus one, two. I think you might have. So keep in mind what you're doing when you integrate what happens to the powers. You, you're you adding one if you integrate. You're adding one, right? Oh, yeah, I did it. Yeah, but negative two plus one, yeah, and that, that, that happens a lot. But yeah, it's actually just going to be minus one over x minus one because this basically becomes x minus one to the negative one over negative one. So it's, it's only, um, it's only ln x minus one um, when it's to the negative first power. Yeah, so that, that's the special case when you're, when you're dealing with uh, rational functions, yeah, the uh, the exponent in the denominator has to be one. So that's why one over x minus one is uh, yields a natural log, and one over x minus one squared doesn't. All right, any more questions on this example? All right. All right, what do we need to do first? Factor, simplify it. Yep, so. Uh, hopefully, um, you realize we don't have to divide this time. How does the denominator factor? We factor out an x, so x times x squared plus four. Okay. Can I go any further than that? So I got a red x from Jacob, and we're yeah we cannot we cannot take this any further. Uh, this is this is fully factored. So this is another special case we're looking at. This is when the factor has degree greater than one. Everything we've looked at so far, the factors have been linear. They've had degree one. This has a factor, or this has a degree of two. So the first part of this, uh, decomposition looks, you know, like you'd expect, A over X. Uh, but one thing to remind you of, um, 
when we're doing this partial fraction process, one thing that we remember our first step is to divide if the degree in the numerator is at least as big as the degree in the denominator. Because what we're trying to force happen, we want the numerator to have less degree than the denominator. So everything we've done so far has had linear factors. So let's just do an example here. If I have x plus five, x plus five has a degree of what? One. So what's the only degree that my numerator could have? Because I want my degrees and my numerators to be less. So this is degree one. Mm -hmm. This one has to be degree zero. And degree zero means no variables, just constants. So in this case, we're gonna have x squared plus four. This is degree two. So what degree could the numerator have? One or zero? Yeah, it could be degree one or degree zero, but we have to plan for, we have to plan for every contingency. So we're gonna assume degree one. If we assume degree one, we might find out it was actually degree zero, but that's okay. So my numerator here is gonna be a degree one. It's gonna be a linear factor. So it's gonna be B X plus C. That's, that's linear x to the first power, I might also have a constant. And I think it's worth stopping there because that is a special case. Any questions about this setup? All right, how do we continue? Multiply both sides by the denominator. Yep, clear the fractions. So now I'm gonna get two X squared minus X plus four equals A times X squared plus four plus B X plus C times X. All right, is there a value of X I could try to get a constant? Can you do zero? Yep, let's try zero. So X equals zero. That's gonna give us, uh, left-hand side becomes four, right-hand side becomes four A, and BX plus C times X, that all vanishes. So then I get A equals one. <laughs> Can I do that again? So it might not be obvious.
I mean, there is no real number you could plug in for X and make uh, A vanish. But what we can do, I mean, no reason you can't mix and match both methods. So we know the other one works. Let's go ahead and go back to it. So I'll factor out the Xs. And really, since we only have two, two uh, unknowns left, uh, this shouldn't be that bad. One plus B plus X, that's only C. And then plus four, we don't really do, need to do anything with that. So even from here, you can probably, you can probably see what B and C are uh, really quickly. Especially C, what's the value for C? Negative one. Yep. C should be negative one. And for now, we'll just say one plus B is equal to two. So B is equal to one. So given that, we can rewrite our integral. So this, become, this became uh, A over X, so one over X. B is one and C is negative one. So one over X plus, wait, 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 wait. Oh yeah, uh, X plus one over X squared plus four. B X minus one because he's negative one. Yeah, thank you. Good catch. All right, so there's our integral. I'll pause for questions on how we got there if you have them. Otherwise, we can start doing the antiderivatives. So what is the integral of one over x dx? Natural log of x. Natural log of, don't forget the absolute value, but yeah. And then this other one, x minus one over x squared plus four. Uh, we already decided we can't factor that one anymore. So how do we deal with that integral? How about splitting it? Would that yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. So let's, instead of dealing with that, let's deal with it up here at the right. I know this is the same as x over x squared plus 4 dx minus the integral of 1 over x squared plus 4 dx. So yeah, I mean, that's, can't handle it directly. So we got to break it up. Now, how do we deal with that integral on the left, x over x squared plus four? Any other tools that we haven't used in a little bit? Anything we can use? Do you like to use substitution? Yep. 
You can do you substitution. What should we call you? Expert plus four. Expert plus four. In that case, du would be equal to two x dx. And dx would be equal to du over two x. So then this one becomes the integral of Actually, is that going to work? You can, instead of um, solving for dx, you can do x dx, so du over 2. Oh, yeah, very good. So then I'm going to go ahead and pull the one half on the outside. Then I'm getting du over u, which hopefully you recognize now. What's the integral of du over u? Natural log of u. Yep. So one half natural log of, and then I'm just going to go ahead and do the substitution all at once. Bonus points if you can tell me why it's okay to leave off the absolute value there. I was gonna ask, why is it okay to leave it off? So if I square any number, any real number and add four, it's gonna be positive. So I don't need to, I don't need to, I don't need the help from absolute value to make it positive. But if you feel better, you can always just put absolute value on it. So that one is ready to go, plus one half times the natural log of x squared plus four. And then how do we deal with this last one? Does it look familiar? Tan inverse x by four, x by two. Yep, this is the um, inverse tangent of x over two. Any last thoughts on this one? Okay. All right. I'll take my cues from you all. How should I start? You can divide it. You can divide it. Yep. So 4x squared minus 3x plus 2 divided by 4x squared minus 4x plus 3. 1. So really what we're looking at is one plus X minus one over four X squared minus four X plus three. All right, good first move. Now what should we do? Uh, 
we write three in terms of four plus one. Rewrite three in terms of four plus one. Would you mean four, four, four minus, four minus one? one? Four minus one. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Oh no 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 that won't work. That won't work because um you can group it. Yeah. So typically, so we have a quadratic here. Um, it's typically more useful to split up the middle term if you're going to split it up. So minus, minus x x plus two x. So let's go ahead and split up into. Uh, you said plus six minus two. Yeah. Okay. Four x squared plus six x minus two x plus three. All right. If we factor it up in pairs, we should get two x times two x plus three. And I don't think that's going to work. It's the other way around. Is it? No, it's not. Because even if I think if you do this, it would still have the plus. It's yeah. So way. basically, you want these numbers, you want your, these, whatever you split this up into, uh, they need to multiply together to give you positive 12x squared. So they either need to be both. Both positive or both negative. And in that case, I don't think minus four is going to get you. Um, then we apply the, the, the partial right, right away then. Um, oh, yeah. I even forgot what I was going after with this. Can we can we just can we get integrate this directly? So this is it's a little strange, but in this case, yeah, we can. So and just to kind of make this even more, more clear, let's look at the discriminant. So maybe it's been a while since you've looked at that, but the discriminant, discriminant gives you a good idea as to, you know, whether this thing factors, how many, how many real roots it has. So B squared minus four AC equals 16 minus four times four times three. So that is 16 minus 48. That's a negative number. Which really bottom line what that means is that this quadratic doesn't factor and that it has it has no real roots. So this thing is as factored as it could be. So it might not be obvious, but U substitution can be used here. Let's just set U up with the whole denominator. Actually, that's not going to work either. I'm starting to wonder if maybe I just type something down wrong. Yeah, let me go ahead and uh, put this one on hold for now. I'm I am fairly certain that I that I mistyped something because I don't think this is going to work. Um, I'll get back to you on on that one there. So the last two examples I wanted to do here, um, I've thrown a few special cases at you in terms of how to decompose these. For these last two examples, we are not going to integrate. All I really wanna do is 
basically set up the uh, kind of the skeleton. So I think it's pretty clear that the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. So I'll take some cues from you. How would I set this up? In fact, I'm gonna do an equal sign over here. What are all my different um, individual rational functions gonna look like? On one by x, up oh, like a by x. Sorry. Yeah, but it might not be one, but certainly a over x. Yep, that's one. So we have a linear factor of x. It's not repeated. So yeah, just to deal with that x, I just need to have a over x. What else? X minus one b b over. Yep, there's another one b over x minus one. Uh, same story. Uh, I have a linear factor, x minus one, it's not repeated. So I just need uh, those two terms for that. X squared plus x plus one. Wait, um, no, it's not factorizable. Huh? C, C, C. So, C over X squared plus X plus one. C X plus D. Yeah, in this case, it'll be C X plus D. Why is that? The X is because um, it needs to be like a degree less, but then plus D because there's still more terms. Yeah, exactly. So for this third term here, uh, our denominator is quadratic, it's degree two. And all we know about the denominator is that it's degree less than two. But that means it could be one or it could be zero. Um, so plan for one. You might end up finding, if we were to do this, you might end up finding that C is equal to zero. So really it is degree zero, but uh, yeah, you can't, you can't rely on that. All right, so I think we've successfully dealt with the first three factors. What's going to happen with that x squared plus one to the third? There's going to be an x squared plus one. There's going to be x squared plus one, the whole square, and there's going to be an x squared plus one, the whole square. Yep. Yeah. So that is true. So let's let's do that first. X squared plus one. X squared plus one squared. x squared plus one cubed. Now, what about the denominators, or sorry, the numerators for each of these three? Will the first one be like dx plus f? So same story as before. These are quadratic denominators. So your numerators should plan for, they should allow for the, the degree to be one. All right, how about the next two, uh, denom or next two numerators? Since the, since the denominator is like x squared plus one, but squared, um, so it'd be like x to the fourth, right? So the numerator be like, like gx to the third? Um, no, you, you just need, um, in this case, you just need gx plus h. Um, so when you have those repeated roots, so if you look back to your notes on the example where we had um, one of our factors was x minus one squared. So we had to account for all those powers. Um, but since the factor itself is linear, X minus one was linear in that case. Uh, all of our numerators can be constant. And then by extension, our last was gonna be IX plus J.
Any questions for that one there? Right. I had one more. I don't know if it's worthwhile to go into. Um, yeah, we got three minutes left. So let's go ahead and put, uh, pause it here. Um, I will upload these slides tonight. Uh, before I let you go, one thing that I, I think earlier I said that the test would start next Tuesday at 840. So I'm in a different time zone right now and I'm, I keep getting thrown between uh, Arizona and Idaho time. The test will start at 740. So yeah, halfway through class, I'll, I'll, I'll start the test. Um, first half of that period from 610 to 740 will be review. Um, and I think that's it. If anybody has any questions, um, I'll stick around for a few minutes, not too long, but I'll stick around for a few minutes. Uh, otherwise, the most uh, tonight's quiz should be available if you want to get started on it. Uh, otherwise, I will see you all tomorrow. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Thank you. Um, professor, I, 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 I tried it out and it actually makes sense like that the X square, because you have an extra X square on the top. I guess. Um, so, uh, sorry, well, remind me what you're uh, referring to? The the A by um, the linear term and the second one, uh, B by the that whole term square. The, that oh, question. okay. So you left off oh. the, uh, the, you left off the linear one and it didn't, didn't work? Um, I, I, I mean, it didn't work, but it's like, um, but I'm trying to intuitively understand why it's not working. Um, okay. Um, I mean, really, the the real reason it's not working is because uh, let me see if I can, let me see if I can sort of whiteboard. So I, if memory serves, is something like this. It's like four x over um, x plus one x minus one squared. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, let me just go ahead and do this. I have not done it and I'm kind of curious to see what happens. A over X plus one plus B over X minus one squared. Four X equals A times X minus one squared plus B times X plus one. So let's say I want X to equal one. I'll have four equals two B. So B equals two. And if I have X equals negative one, then I'll have negative four equals four A, which is equal to A or gives me A equal negative one. So from there I have this negative one over X plus one plus two over X minus one squared. Mm -hmm. um, why is that not erase? No, it doesn't really erase. Okay. So it worked, but is this really equal? So if I add these together, so my common denominator is going to be x plus one times x minus one squared. So this will be negative x minus one squared plus two times x plus one. So minus x squared minus two x plus one plus two x plus one over x plus one. So if I do that, um, then what happens to the numerator? I get four X, the ones cancel, minus X squared over X plus one times X minus one squared. So you got the four X to match up. Um, 
So reason, the basically the reason you were able to get a value for A and a value for B is because you weren't really you didn't have a way to catch this um, to make sure this x squared term agreed. But yeah, when you go back and add those together, and granted, maybe we should have done that at least once for the examples we did today. But when you go back and add those together, you're not going to get the original rational function you started with. Um. Hmm. Okay, it actually makes sense. Like, you know, if you take x, x minus, that square is there. And yeah. Uh, that, yeah, yeah, that square is there. Unless a sort of like becomes zero or something, it won't, uh, that, and then b becomes something else. Like, it, actually, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't get that, you know, for x. So you would automatically need some sort of like uh, x minus one or something bottom that extra term yeah so yeah there's, there's of... basically there's something missing and yeah. because we did this the other way we we know what that what that missing part is mm -hmm. now, now it makes intuitive sense okay good yeah thanks a lot no problem have a good night yeah, yeah.